So I'm just welcoming you here this morning. Thank you for coming. And I'm sure the fact that we are small in number will not deter us. We will make up for our lack of numbers by the attention which we pay and the quality of our questions at the end of the session. I would just like to explain very briefly what the CWST is. The Centre for Women's Studies in Theology exists to provide a space where people can reflect theologically on the situation of women in church and society. And we also aim to support women in academia in this university and beyond. And we do this by organizing a series of events throughout the year, some of a very academic nature, some more social, and some liturgical or spiritual. We aim to have at least one event every month, so please look out for information about what we're doing on Toledo. You can also give me your email address if you prefer to receive personal notifications. We are very happy this morning to welcome Dr. Pauline Dimmock to speak to us. Thank you for being here with us. She is from the University of Malta, where she has been teaching for the last four years. She's going to talk to us today about gender and sainthood, Martin Luther and Urs van Balthasar. And this is hot on the publication of her book, The Authority of the Saints, Drawing on the Theology of Urs van Balthasar. So thank you very much, and I would like you to welcome Dr. Pauline Dimmock. Thank, thank you so much. I'm also very happy to be here. Actually, my book tackles quite a different perspective, and Luther does not feature in my book. So if you, it's Luther you're interested in, you know, the book is not what you... Sh it, it won't help. So what I have tried to do here is actually tie a number of threads together that may seem to be very dissimilar. And... What I would like you to do is actually try and react to what I'm saying. So to react means not necessarily to agree, but rather to challenge me, because I want this also to develop into something else, okay? So as you can see, I have included the Reformation, which is not something that I had tackled in the book. And I'm going to be using Hans, both Hans Urs von Balthasar and, excuse me, I may need to, say in this, to change the slot of my... Okay. And that's why it wasn't working. It was off. <laughs> so first of all, what I'm going to say is based on the idea that sainthood can be applied to individuals. There is a tendency in Lutheranism for the individual saints not to be recognized as much as the community of saints or as much as different categories of saints like the apostles or the fathers of the church, okay? Whereas in Catholicism, saints as individuals are recognized as saints. Now, you may already be aware that the idea of sainthood and the recognition of saints changed over time. So even within the Catholic Church, whereas originally it was the martyrs that were considered to be saints, that move, that changed through different eras. And, you know, today it is almost the person who is completely generous, who spends all his time and life for others, who is considered to be the authentic saint. But you can see that there is a series of changes as to what makes a saint a saint. Now, this is something that occurs 
in many of the contemporary writers on the idea of sainthood in recent literature, particularly in feminist theologians, the idea that gender has influenced our concept of sainthood, it has influenced who could become a saint. You know, gender has a lot to do with the concept of sainthood itself. Now, the era of the female saint, you could say, began in the 13th century. And you can see that the number of female saints increased in the Middle Ages from, you know, the very few that we had in early Christianity to what we had later on in the 15th. But you can also see the you know, difference between the number of male saints and the number of female saints there. Now, different cultural and religious forces in different regions influenced the writing and reception of the holy women of that area. I am especially interested in how saints are recognized as saints, not necessarily in the form of canonization, but in the form of authority. How are people, how are individuals recognized as authoritative? That is what my book is about. What is it that makes an individual authoritative for others, whether it is living during their time or living after their time? And what effect does the saint have over others? Now, you can imagine that this is not, can, cannot be generalized because different cultural eras and different locations would influence how a woman would influence and how the people surrounding that individual respond to that individual. So one question that one, many people ask is how holy women came to be recognized as saints. But it's not really the process of canonization that I care about. It's what is it on the part of the audience, so to speak, of the spectators that made them recognize that these holy women were extraordinary and should not be forgotten. So really, my interest is more this, the effect that saints leave on others, the authority which they have over others, including ourselves, you know, whether it is someone who we consider to be holy, perhaps within our you know, group of acquaintances, or someone who died 300 years ago, but who's, whom we still consider to be influential as people. So, I feel that saints are not only extremely virtuous people, but you could call them loci of power. So they are sources of power. Now, 
I don't understand this in the medieval way, you know, where the saints could be seen as patrons, so rather than speak to God, you ensure that you befriend a saint who could then bring about advantages for you. I don't look at it in that way. There are still Catholics who understand the saints in that patron way. I mean, I come from a country where, you know, we have a patron saint for every town and village. Festivities occur, there's a lot of devotion and a lot of veneration for these saints. No, when I see it as a, when I see the saint as a locus of power, I see that saint more as a source of influence on the person who gets to know that holy figure. In the Middle Ages, the reputations of holy women was often based on supernatural, charismatic authority. So what it was that made women authoritative in the Middle Ages would have been, and difficult to explain, charisma that these individuals would have had, which was associated with the supernatural, and that is how those individuals were, were then considered to be authoritative. It's interesting to see that holy women were depicted as conduits through whom div divine knowledge flowed to humanity. So they were, they were not just extraordinary because they seemed to have supernatural powers and that could not be explained by the understanding of the time, but they seemed to know more. They seemed to be the passage through which God could speak to humankind, and they were recognized as such. What's interesting is that even here, though, you know, m women were called vessel far more often than men. So if you're a vessel, you're a passive. You're just receiving that knowledge, you know. So with men, the idea of the vessel is not as common, but with women, it's much more common. And you can see that this is a feminist theologian writing, women were vessels. That means they were passive on the receiving end, being given the knowledge, You can see the difference of the grounds of sanctity in this quote by Catherine Mooney. The sanctity of men tended to be based more on their this-worldly offices and achievements, whereas with holy women, their sanctity was derived more from their relatively easy access to the other world. So in a way, for the men, it's more earthly. For the males, for male saints, it's more so for the males, it's more earthly. For the female saints, it's more divine. So there is an acknowledgement of the sainthood of the female, you know, because God has gifted that 
female. With males, many of the saints would have been males who were in offices or who had achieved something that was admirable. There is also something else that's often mentioned where sainthood is concerned. And this is that with women, there is a lot of pain in there and suffering in their sainthood. And this pain can take various forms. With men, such signs are not as common. So physical illnesses, flagellation, severe penances, the stigmata. I'm sure you already know that during the later Middle Ages, the suspicion of prophetic women had grown. Women who were mystics were often misjudged and sometimes even had to suffer consequences of that. It's also interesting that many of the stories that we have of women mystics are told through the eyes and pens of males. So although there was an increase of women saints during the Middle Ages, almost all the males who were canonized were clerics. And you can see that the laity is only or almost completely represented by females. Now, Luther comes within this context of the Middle Ages. And his attitude towards women does not seem to be very laudable. Okay, we have to see him within the context, of course. In an essay entitled Europe's flawed hero, we are told that Luther enjoyed sexist jokes and considered women natural inferiors. And you can read the rest on the screen. These are difficult words for women today to accept. Now, should we see Luther as an example of the attitude of reformed churches towards women? No. But should we look at Luther as an example of the attitude of reformed churches towards saints? Yes. Luther designates the invocation of the saints as one of the abuses of the Antichrist. So he is very open about the condemnation of the saints, of the, not of the saints, sorry, of the invocation of the saints. His issue was firstly to do with commemoration should the saints be commemorated as individuals? And he would say no. So you could have categories of saints, 
being commemorated, just as in the first example, the apostles, for instance, but not individual saints. The second issue, both with Luther and with the, reformation, the Reformed churches, was whether saints could be invoked, whether one could seek help from them. And this also was no. Of course, the emphasis in the reformers is that there is only one mediator, Christ. And the saints should not take the place of the one mediator. That is why he considers the invocation of the saints one of the abuses of the Antichrist. The third issue is to do with veneration, and here again, this is not acceptable to the re Reformed churches. He uses the word worship instead of veneration. He stated that the worship of saints was one of the elements in Catholic devotion which ought to be eliminated. It is seen as an insult to Christ because it's taking away some of the, or all of the, uniqueness of Christ who is the only mediator, the only intercessor, the only savior. So, both Calvin and Luther were actually quarreling not against having special examples of the grace of God. But they were against the false saints and the false honor to saints, which would have been rampant at their time. Now, in this very interesting book, entitled Women and the Reformation, Kersey Stierna says that teaching courses on the Reformation is no longer feasible without the inclusion of women as subjects in the story of the Reformation and its evaluation. My argument is that the Reformation left an effect not only on how sainthood was to be conceived, but also on how women were to be conceived. And this is what Stierna writes. And I am in total agreement with this. Coinciding with the dismissal of beloved female figures in religious practice and piety, such as the Virgin Mary and the female saints, the deletion of the offices of nuns and powerful abbesses meant the disappearance of recognizable examples for women's religious leadership and spiritual roles and deeply felt changes in spiritual life. So what am I am arguing is that Luther and the reformers by taking out these women figures from within the tradition would have left, would have led to 
a, what shall I call it, a dilution of the female authority within the church because the figures that would have been considered authoritative and who were female were in a way abolished. I'm still using Kirsty Stierna, but she quotes Davis. The loss of saints affected men and women unequally. So you could no longer address prayers to a woman. Although you could still pray, obviously, to the persons of the Trinity. So for women, the consequences for their identities went even deeper. Now today, in current Lutheran liturgies and lectionaries, there is commemoration of the saints, where the apostles and the evangelists are concerned, you know, the martyrs, the fathers of the church, we have all saints. But the names of the individual saints are rarely mentioned, and I believe that the female saint is very important to highlight, to acknowledge to confirm the authority of the female within the church. Now, Kirsi Stierna does acknowledge that even during the Reformation, there were some very interesting leading figures who were subjects rather than, you know, they were active during the Reformation. Several women in varied visible leadership roles in different Reformation contexts. Only now are they coming to light. You know, this is quite a recent publication. And Stierna asks these great questions in trying to evaluate the role of women during the Reformation. She tries to answer these questions, which are so important. Who was she? What kind of a reformer was she? Because she would have been a reformer too. How did she understand herself as a woman and as a reformer? What did she write or do about the issues that mattered to her? So we do realize that even within the reformed denominations, there were women who were extremely active. And these are some of the women whom she mentions and whom she calls the matriarchs of the Reformation. And she actually provides some background to these women, which shows how amazing they were. But this is again recent, you know, this acknowledgement of their greatness is quite recent. So for centuries, without the presence of the female saints within Lutheranism, there was a huge loss. 
What about during the Counter-Reformation on the Catholic side? You can see that women do not appear so much. If they do, they would have had to be religious, which in a way dehumanizes, in a way, the lay woman. Or perhaps Italian or Spanish. And the Catholic Reformation also affected women in several respects. I guess because of the confusion of the times, you have a reaff reaffirmation of hierarchical male authority. So the reaction on the part of the church was to become even more male, so to speak. So even within the Catholic side, women were less of authority figures than they had been prior to the Reformation. So I'm just explaining what the Counter-Reformation stands for. So this is the period in immediately after the Protestant Reformation and which responds to it, which begins with the Council of Trent and finishes in 1648. So these are the consequences. During the Counter-Reformation, women had less chance of becoming saints. Saints were more likely to be Christ's handmaidens than his brides. The witch hunts increased. At the same time, the supernatural aspects of the female saints grew. So you have records of visions, celestial apparitions, and dialogues, and prophetic voices, and so on. And, besides the witch hunts, any woman who claimed divine inspiration was immediately subject to special supervision. And you had a male confessor assigned to her to review her manifestation. And the fifth point, it was woman's part to root out the evil within herself, whereas with the male saints, they always seemed to be gifted with special gifts, forms of clairvoyance, so that they could notice the sins of others, read into other people's hearts, whereas the woman realizes how sinful she is. Okay, it's taken a long time to come to Hans Urs von Balthasar, hasn't it? I have to say, he had huge respect for the women saints. 
I'm focusing in particular on this work. Two Sisters in the Spirit, which are really a, it's, it's uh, the uniting of two works of his, one on Therese of Lisieux and one on Elizabeth of the Trinity. And they're both Carmelite sisters, both of whom died very young, and whom, for whom Balthazar has, has huge respect. So some background to Therese of Lisieux, and some background to Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity. And what we have here are two contextualized, actual, existential examples of how Christ and the Church act within concrete, historical lives. There are a lot of insights. You don't have to read all of that, but there are a lot of insights in this book about sanctity in general, about mysticism in general. What's mostly interesting and what I have found mostly interesting <clears throat> is that according to Hans Urs von Balthasar, Therese of Lisieux is the answer to the problems which Luther brought up during the Reformation. So he is using a female saint which makes this almost ironic, in order to, he believes, answer the issues that emerged during the Reformation. So this is still, I'm talking quite generally about the contents of that book, Two Sisters in the Spirit. I'll just go through these quite quickly. He is speaking about Therese, Therese of Lisieux here, and he is saying that she has an explicitly doctrinal mission. And you can see that that is part of this quote. Her role was to make certain accepted but neglected truths astonishingly clear. The center of her doctrinal mission is, according to, Liz to Hans Urs von Balthasar, to relate human sinners to divine mercy in a new way. I don't know whether you can recognize something of Luther there, based on the interpenetration of justice and mercy within the Godhead. And here is where he says it very clearly. And I have a sheet which I'd like to distribute now. It's actually one quotation from this book by Hans Urs von Balthasar. But you can see how clear he is. Therese of Lisieux can be re regarded as the Catholic answer to the demands and questions raised by Luther. So, von Balthasar not only pushes Therese forward as an authoritative theologian, he also pushes forward her doctrine and her form of sanctity, which he claims are a, are a response to Luther and to the reformers. <clears throat> 
This is something about the little way of the race. Justification by faith is one of her main theological points. I'll just go through these slides very quickly. The full quote appears in the last slide, so you'll be able to see this as well. And here it is. This is what you have on your sheet. One would have to be blind not to see that Therese's doctrine of the little way answers point by point the program outlined by the reformers and that she presents the church's bold, irrefutable answer to Protestant spirituality. And he makes a list of what he calls the innumerable points of contact between Therese and the reformers. Then further down, he says, what divides Therese from Luther is that the drama of sin never entwines itself around her soul. She recognizes the drama of God's descending into the nothingness of the creature and the flame of love with which the absolute God unites himself to his creature's nothingness, and so on and so forth. So, I hope that this talk has made you think, which was my, you know, my intention, and may we have time for your response now, please? And perhaps your reactions. Do you think we should use the microphone for the questions as well? Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first one regards what could be done systematically with the points you make with respect to the difference between Luther and um, uh, von Balthasar and the different, it, because it seems like an arc that you've traced in, in the argument is that the Reformation itself help, helped to cause the diminishment of, or one could use your argument to make the claim that uh, the Reformation itself and, and the ideas that got let loose in the Reformation ended up diminishing women, whether or not we attribute that directly to Luther or to the, the zeitgeist or whatever, but that the Reformation itself does that. I'm curious to know, would you yourself make that claim, or is that just a reading that one could give to your, um, to your presentation? And then my second question, I'm just curious by this last sentence of where Balthazar critiques Teresa's mistake to have restricted the whole drama between God and the soul to what happened in her own case. If you could just explain a little more what he means by that. Okay, I think what you said about your understanding of this lecture is correct. I was trying to make that argument that there was a diminishment within the Reformation because the female saints were absent. And there was also a diminishment in the counter-Reformation as a consequence of that. How would I read this quote systematically? I think one would have to take each statement by one by one in a way, each statement that he makes. The last sentence I understand as, and this is 
this is where Hansers von Balthasar and Luther may not agree. You see, with Luther, you can never really establish whether someone is saintly or not. And that is the reason why he would be against reverence for the saints and against canonizations because, you know, saint, sainthood is spiritual and you can never establish it by any means. Whereas Hansurs von Balthasar would argue you can establish it. And with most saints, it's very clear because their theology is correct. In fact, he uses the word correct. Their theology is correct. So he, with Balthazar, he makes a distinction between the saints and the non-saints, and it's much more clear for him. With Luther, he may speak about good examples, but he would never establish their sainthood. With Balthazar, you have good theology, and therefore, good sainthood, okay? And according to Balthazar, Therese's mistake is to have restricted the whole drama between God and the soul to the saints. She was exceptional. She was one of these exceptional saints. So he is saying her mistake was that she judged individuals too subjectively. And she did not realize that not everyone has the same relationship with God, but that the drama of God goes beyond that very intimate relationship that goes on between the saint and God. That's how I read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That her mistake was that she always related her own soul with God, you know, in an almost individualistic way. Yes. And lost the larger social significance. Yes, I think so. I think so. She almost believed that it could happen to everybody, whereas Balthazar does speak about the gift of mysticism, for example, which is a gift, and it, it's not for everybody. That doesn't mean that not everyone is called to be a saint, but mysticism and sainthood are not the same. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, you, you touched quite early on in the lecture on the notion of women as a vessel. And I'm, I mean, I assume you agree, I don't know that this generally stems from Mariology and from the idea of Mary and the fiat and the let it be done. And so Mary is, of course, the, the vessel par excellence, and that's where we get the idea of the Immaculate Conception and such like. But this idea of female passivity and tied into the idea that they are the ones that receive the visions, they are the ones that are the mystics, they are the ones like Julian of Norwich and Marguerite Perrette and all that. But since that's sort of been, if I understand you correctly, sort of lost due to the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, and there's not a lot of focus on it. How do you think this can be reclaimed? Or do you think it can be reclaimed? And if so, how? How can we use that as a very empowering form of mysticism and as almost a better model of devotion or a more powerful version of a lay devotion to, for women? Thank you for that question. I think the way forward is a hermeneutics of suspicion and it's an application of the exegetical historical criticism. So it is going back to the texts and trying to understand what wa was behind those texts and behind those representations, because we do realize that even Mary herself, and you can see this if you compare what was said about Mary in the Catholic tradition and what has been said by feminist theologians more recently, that Mary was not the passive vessel that she is made out to be and that the fiat itself need not be understood simply as a passive reaction to God's will. She was being very active there. 
you know, so the representation of women over the ages needs to be reread, you know, in, with the understanding and the scholarship that we have today. You know, I did say, of course, that the fact that women were almost deleted from the calendar had a consequence, but of course, I wasn't saying that the way female saints were represented was necessarily the best way they could have been, you know, or necessarily fair to the individual saint. Because as you know, I mean, Catholicism has never stopped venerating the saints, but we do know that with the saints, it is often virginity, celibacy, obedience. These are the qualities that are generally appreciated and encouraged, even in women who read their stories, whereas their lives can be read as being very active, very dynamic, you know, and immensely exemplary on the action side, rather than on the passive side. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to go back to the quote from the two sisters, because there's something that I haven't quite understood. Um, in the third line of the quote, as it's on our page here, um, it says that Therese presents the church's bold, irrefutable answer to Protestant spirituality. And I don't understand how it can be irrefutable. Yeah, yes, well, you know, that comes from Hans Urs von Balthasar's style. Uh, he has been criticized by Karen Kilby as having a, a God overview of the world and of theology. You know, you, you would be aware that Hans Urs von Balthasar had his own publication house and that people did not edit his works, they did not read them because he had the freedom to publish them, you know, himself. So he is very certain, I understand it, that the church has already an answer to Protestant spirituality and that it, it is irrefutable, so to him it seems very clear, and that the church has, may not have as yet formulated it clearly, but Therese has. That's how I understand him. You know, so he's saying, in a way he's saying something which I would agree with, which is that if we really are to understand theology, the relationship of humanity with God and who God is, it is to the mystics that we ought to go. You know, they have the best answers because they are the ones who have related most closely to the divine. I would agree with him there. And I would agree that Therese of Lisieux was a mystic. But to say that the church already is very clear, it has its answer to Protestant spirituality, you know, to assume that it will be certainly satisfactory to everybody and almost irrefutable, you know, not almost, and irrefutable, I think in a way he's being, um, what shall I say, pretentious in a way, isn't he? He's, a, he's, a, he's being a bit pretentious. Mm -hmm. what, what year was this well, this was quite early, actually. One of his early works. This was 1950s. So before the canonization? Um, be, before Elizabeth's canonization. 2016. Shall I go back to my... Because I don't exactly remember when Therese was canonized. No, we don't have it there. So Elizabeth of the Trinity was canonized in 2016, beatified in 1984. 
And she was beatified in 1923, canonized in 1925, so she would have been canonized almost 30 years previously. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The doctor of the church came later. It came later. It came, uh, I would say, towards the end of the 20th century. So that came quite late. Um, but the uh, canonization in 1925... Balthazar is very interesting because he has full faith in the canonized saints. But there are areas in his trilogy where he actually widens the concept of canonization to people who are, who are not necessarily canonized by the church, but whom the Holy Spirit makes into a canon for others, so as makes into a rule for others. Because he says there are in, in the church's history, there are instances when the church pushed someone towards sainthood and then he or she was forgotten. And then are, there are other instances when the Holy Spirit pushed that saint and the church had to say yes to the Holy Spirit because it could not do otherwise. It, the, the, what shall I say it? The uh, movement was too strong for the church to resist. So, of course, being a Catholic, the canonization would have, would, would have been important for him, but canonization, the church's canonization is, is not necessarily the only way. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for your presentation. It was really insightful for me on a personal level. But I guess picking up from um, Bess's comment and what you yourself said about von Barth is that I, I guess I would be curious as to why you chose um, von Balthazar um, in this uh, discourse. Um, for one of the reasons, because he, he puts forward Therese of Lisieux as the answer to all of these problems. And the second um, thing I wanted to ask was, um, is there any way in terms of reading this dialogue between what happened um, with the Reformation and with the Counter-Reformation and what preceded the Reformation of um, looking at Luther's stance towards the saint as also something to be considered, meaning his reaction against what um, he considered to be um, wrong or false, if there's anything to be recovered there. Because it seems as if what, from what has taken place in terms of the counter-reformation stance, that not much has uh, progressed over the years to the contemporary time and how you consider the scene. Thank you very much for that question. First of all, my interest is, of course, because I'm interested in Hans Sors von Balthasar himself. And only a fortnight ago, I gave a paper in which I compared Luther's and Hans Sors von Balthasar's concept of the communio sanctorum. It's quite different to this, you know, because that's also an ecclesiological concept, not just uh, to do with saints and sanctity. So that's why I thought about Hans Urs von Balthasar and about what he had said about Therese of Lisieux. And I could see that link with the Reformation because I had been asked to include that too. So I think that answers your question of why I chose Hans Urs von Balthasar and Therese because I'm obviously also interested in why he saw her, you know, and how he thought that she would resolve the whole issue of the doctrines that were challenged during the Reformation period. Then the other question concerning whether, you know, what 
Lutherans can reclaim, I think all that introduction which I gave you was meant also for you to think about what medieval times were like, but I did not really focus on the Catholic extremes that were taking place. I mean, Luther's pilgrimage to Rome was a shock to him. That is when he realized, you know, he could no longer remain silent. And he could see that the focus was no longer Christ, it was more the saints. And there, I think, he has reclaimed something rather than lost something. So, what I think that the Lutherans can reclaim, even if they insist that saints are difficult to recognize and to canonize, because sainthood is a spiritual reality, but the examples of women in particular, and of males, individual males, but in particular, the examples of women must be celebrated. I don't know whether any one of you has read the book entitled Saints of uh, Friends of God and Prophets by Elizabeth Johnson, who is a feminist theologian in the US. And a substantial part of that book is actually She's Catholic, okay, but a substantial part of that book is about how we can reclaim the experience of women, even within the Catholic tradition, women who are everyday women, our mothers, our sisters, and so on. And she actually has, you know, the forms of celebration that could take place in which women you know, this is something you could perhaps look into and see whether that is possible to put into practice. Um, how these women can be celebrated, even within the Catholic tradition, we need to do that, I think. Especially because the female saints have not always been represented as models of, for the laywoman. I'm not sure whether I have answered all your questions, I'm sorry. I think it's now time. Um, you did say that um, Luther, the, the, he, he was not into the individual saints, but with Mariology, it was okay. I wonder, since the Protestants are more focused on the Bible, what about the examples of women in both Old and New Testaments? Did he say something about it either as a group or as individuals? Thank you. Um, I think he does, of course, recognize that there are women, but you do realize that even the, within the Catholic tradition, the women of the Bible have not really been treated as they should have. You know, the Acts of the Apostles now has been studied by feminist theologians. The names have been cropping up. We're trying to understand what the role within the church was and so on. So I don't think we should expect too much of Luther himself. And, you know, now, obviously, because the scriptures is the basic text, feminist theologians within the Lutheran tradition are, of course, also using the knowledge that we have now, the scholarship that we have now, to emphasize the importance of the female. But I think there is a need for more because the biblical text remains what it is, but, you know, sanctity has continued for the past 2,000 years, hasn't it? And I'll leave you with that question. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I would like to extend sincere thanks to Dr. Pauline Dimmock for a very interesting lecture, which highlights an area which has perhaps only recently come to the fore and which nicely ties together the aims of the CWST and, of course, the Luther anniversary this year of which we're so aware. So thank you very much.
After we've finished here, a group of us are hoping to treat Dr. Dimmock to coffee, and any of you are welcome to join us if you would like to continue conversation with her. Can I just take a brief moment to advertise our two next events? On the 28th of November in the evening, we are showing a film about Luther and Katharina van Bora. It'll be in the evening. You'll be notified of the times nearer the time. Um, this film will be in German, but with English subtitles. And then on the 7th of December, again in the evening, we'll notify you of the time, we are creating an ecumenical Advent liturgy for all. So come and celebrate Advent with us. It's open to everybody, um, no matter what denomination you are from, and we will be breaking bread together in that very special period in the run-up to Christmas. So thank you for your support today. Thank you for your questions. And can we please show our appreciation to Dr. Dimmock?